Hello. It is a good time to talk about Leonardo da Vinci and music theory. So if you're part of the replay crew, as always, let me know where you're coming from. And uh, we're going to geek out on some stuff that is, uh, it seems like it's deep when it comes to music theory, but it's actually pretty surface level. And, um, but, but deeper than most people go. <laughs> so that's uh, kind of saying something. Now, when we talk about music theory, I'm just going to jump right into it because uh, this is a really important point that um, a lot of musicians don't get to, or a lot of people who just kind of poo poo the idea of music theory, they have this mental block in their mind. And so I want to speak to that. Now, it's uh, something that I had to process myself in my study of music, music theory for songwriting. Um, and even accepting music theory as something that was worth, worth like checking out. Um, and I still like regularly will see comments on social media and I'll hear people saying some kind of uh, like it's kind of their defensive mechanism goes up and they kind of like <clears throat> still kind of take a jab at music theory uh, thinking that it's a valid point And we're going to talk through why it's not a valid point. Now, you may agree with me already, or you may have some friends who make this point, and this helps give you the, uh, you know, some, some clarity, I think. It helps me have the clarity to speak to some of these points. And uh, hey, first, just want to say, Keen Music, very cool to see you on. Virtuous Heretic, as always, cool to see you on. And Devon, very cool. Glad that you're here. And we're going to geek out on some some good stuff with music theory. So, um now, music theory, I'm going to share, uh, and Dave Mercer, very cool, from Geeksville, USA. Um, we are all uh, residents of Geeksville, USA on these live streams, and I'm so happy you're here. Um, cool to see you on, Tony and Stephen. Awesome, awesome. Um, Southeast Australia. So I don't know what time it is where you are right now, uh, but it's a different time zone than I am, and you might be in the middle of the night. Um, so very cool. I'm glad that you're on. And uh, okay, so Leonardo da Vinci is not known as being a musician. He did play music. He even invented some instruments because he was an inventor as well as an artist. Uh, but it's not like when you get into music theory, Leonardo da Vinci is the first person who comes to mind. But he has some really interesting insights that, that help in your exploration of music theory and discovery of what it can reveal. So let's get into this diagram here that shows... Uh, that shows music theory. Now, we talk about this periodically. If you're new here, this may be the first time you've seen it. If you're not, it won't be the first time you've seen it, but it's definitely worth repeating what music theory means by definition, because a lot of times people just dismiss music theory as this esoteric, difficult thing that isn't worth looking into. And looking into is the operative term, because theory comes from the Greek theoria, which means to look at, view, or see. And since music is sound and sound is invisible, to see sound seems like a contradiction in terms. That is, unless you use the natural patterns of sight, color, to see the otherwise invisible patterns of sound, music. So music theory is a really important thing. Now, I recently saw a comment, someone had commented, they had quoted Oppenheimer, if I'm saying that right, um, definitely top of mind right now with with the movie by Christopher Nolan. Uh, and I may be paraphrasing here, but I guess Oppenheimer said that you can only go so far with theory. In other words, you know, mental gymnastics, you know, to be able to project that into the real world, there's definitely a step, which is true. But it kind of, I think, is uh, an inherent dismissal, unless I misinterpreted the comment a dismissal of theory as if, hey, you know, you have to apply theory, which is the whole point, music theory for songwriting. Um, but a lot of times theory is just kind of dismissed as an almost impractical thing. And so we're going to look at both the connotation of theory, which literally means to see sound, or in this case, theory is to see, and music theory means to see sound, and then there's the denotation. Uh, well, sorry, the denotation is literally to see sound. 
and then uh, the connotation, though, is often just seen as this kind of like uh, you can you can take it or leave it. You really may not need theory. And Leonardo da, Vin da Vinci tells us with his life and his work that it's worth worth checking out. And not only that it's worth it, but he has some cool insights into how to approach theory. There's a really good book by Michael Gelb called How to Think Like Da Vinci. And he talks about, I think it's like seven different principles where he, uh, as a researcher and fan of Leonardo da Vinci, like uh, studied his approach to things and came up with different principles like sfumato. And if you're in Italy, you know, please forgive my, <laughs> my pronunciation, but sfumato means smoke. And he had Leonardo da Vinci had like a smoky way that he uh, drew or, or not drew, well, drew and painted where there wasn't like a distinct line or outline around images that he did because he had noticed as a scientist that if you look at any object, it looks like we can see distinct lines. Like I'm, I'm pointing to things in the room here, but if you look at any object where you are, it seems like we can see distinct lines around things, but we really can't. Like if you look at it, even if you have 20, 20 vision, there's always like a slight blur around the very edge. Like if you zoom in with your eyesight, there's still always the slight blur because of the way that we perceive light and all of that. So sumato was a principle, for example, and another one was connezione, which means connection. And basically he was saying that everything is connected, which definitely plays in with the idea of being able to see sound with color. Color, a seemingly disparate discipline and field of study from music, to put those two together seems preposterous until you see that it actually works. And that is literally the key to music theory is to see sound. Um, and so let's get into uh, this a little bit more. So when you see sound, now I talk about this in other videos, I'm not gonna necessarily dive into what these patterns mean, but once you can, can see patterns, uh, the patterns of music with color, it, it like shows that there's a lot going on here. There's this inherent geometric framework that is underlying everything. Now, again, I started this by saying that, you know, it's easy for people to dismiss theory because they're like, ah, eh, who needs theory? Sight unseen, that's an easy statement to make. When you see it, though, and I'm just looking at two keys, the key of D here and the key of A. And these are these patterns show that the intervals, which are really the fundamental uh, relationships between notes in any given key, that they are consistent from one key to the next D and A. It's the same patterns. The significance of these patterns comes into play when you see how they're applied to scales and modes and chords and progressions. Like I say, this is an overview of what these patterns are, but there is this inherent geometry that's going on that if you just say, hey, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, theory isn't everything as Oppenheimer said, but you can't deny that there's something to theory that then with that knowledge you can apply to, to apply that theory in songwriting. Um, now, when Leonardo da Vinci says connezione, and he's talking about connections between things, something that he also was speaking to was the fact that art and science are not distinct things, that they are one and the same. And he was a big, proponent of this and practitioner of the connection between art and science. So uh, he said, and uh, his quote here that I'm going to read is, um, to develop a complete mind, study the science of art, study the art of science, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. It's worth repeating, so I'm going to read that one more time. To develop a complete mind, study the science of art and study the art of science. Learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. It feels like Leonardo da Vinci was giving us musicians a big wink wink. <laughs> like, hey, you should check out why things work the way they do, which is exactly what he did. Now, art is 
you know, art is in the eye of the beholder, as they say. So it's a subjective thing. Science, however, is an objective study of how things work. And Leonardo is telling us that there is a link between the two, that they are flip sides of the same coin. There's a science to how art is developed. And there's also an art to your approach to science. And any great scientist will tell you that they approach their field often as an artist, thinking creatively, thinking outside the box. That's how they come up with what they come up with. Likewise, if you're an artist who only works with emotion or with, you know, just the way that you subjectively feel and hope that that apply or, or can be applied to and can translate into meaningful, coherent songs, you're going to struggle. And I can speak from experience because for the longest time, I was dismissive of and avoidant of music theory, thinking that it was going to cramp my style. Um, when it turns out that once you study the science of art or study music theory, which makes the art of music possible, that's where things really start to happen. So um, speaking of Da Vinci and Michael Gelb gets into this, I think in his book, and then there are other, other histories of Da Vinci. But um, if you didn't know, he had a running spat with um, kind of a rivalry with Michelangelo, who was a contemporary. Michelangelo was super talented. Um, he, uh, oh, well, this is, this is Leonardo, just to put a face to a name. So Leonardo, uh, he knows where it's at. You can see the confidence <laughs> in his eyes because he understood the science um, of, uh, of art. Now, I guess before we get into Michelangelo, let me, uh, me kind of speak a little bit more about Da Vinci. So Da Vinci, the reason that he was confident and knew what was going on is because as a painter, when he wanted to create art, he didn't want to just recreate. I mean, art is an artifice or, you know, a, a facsimile of, of the real world, or at least certainly in the Renaissance, that was like the style, right? It wasn't so abstract. We hadn't gotten to Picasso yet. It was a realistic depiction of the world around them. That was, that was the style, right? So Leonardo wanting to know how to convey and recreate the most realistic paintings or drawings, he got into dissections. Uh, and by that meaning, like he, he <laughs> would go and he, I think this was illegal. It was certainly frowned upon, but he would go in to the morgue and wrap a, a handkerchief because the smell was terrible and wrap a handkerchief around his head, you know, tie it down just to kind of like breathe. And he would just cut open and study cadavers. And so in his notebooks, he, these are, these are his drawings where this is a cadaver where he would draw it from multiple angles because he wanted to understand, he peeled <laughs> these cadavers apart. And he, I mean, he was, he was hardcore, right? Like you have to be into it. Most artists don't do this. Uh, but then of course, as he got into it, he got really interested in the science of anatomy, bones, tissues, tendons, how all of these things work together. He was fascinated, but, and we'll come back to this, seeing things from multiple, multiple angles, because it's key to what we're talking about right now. But he looked at things from multiple angles, uh, not only from the surface level, but literally dissecting human bodies to get deeper into it, to go deeper, and also from multiple angles to understand, to truly understand the structure of his, what, what his object was, in this case, it was a human body, to recreate that in his art realistically. So this is where his rivalry with Michelangelo comes in. Michelangelo was highly acclaimed, an amazing artist in his own right, but Da Vinci was like, yeah, Michelangelo is totally second rate. Like he's not, he's not on the level. The reason Da Vinci made that claim, is, this is Da Vinci and this is Michelangelo. The reason that Da Vinci was like, yeah, Michelangelo sucks is because 
he's like, I have studied, I, Leonardo, have studied the human body with such passion and with such clarity that I have studied the science behind the art. Like I know the muscles, the bone structure, <clears throat> how tendons and muscles work so that I'm not just, you know, on the surface recreating what looks like, you know, the anatomy of the human body. I really know how the eye fits in the socket socket. I really know how cartilage bends, you know, and how it's connected to the tissues. I'm not just kind of like winging it. Now, Michelangelo's winging it was pretty amazing. Um, he painted the Sistine Chapel. And I mean, you can see that it looks like he may have studied anatomy, uh, but not to the same level that Leonardo did. And to this day, Leonardo, I mean, Michelangelo is revered as an amazing artist, but Leonardo is like that next level because he really, really, really understood. And so, you know, you compare these two, um, you know, David is Michelangelo's, you know, most famous statue. And granted, it does look pretty real. Like it looks like he, he knew what he was doing. Um, and uh, Mona Lisa, though, is by Leonardo is, is known as the most amazing artwork. Um, part of it was because it was so well done. And actually, there's a lot more to the Mona Lisa than just because it's famous. When you see it in person, which I have not seen it in person, but there's like a translucence. Like he he played with, Leonardo played with different textures and different layers. I mean, he worked on it for like 15 years or something, um, the Mona Lisa. And there's like a, a special translucence that I guess like if you're driving down the street and you see stop signs or, you know, barricades that have that reflective light that is like, almost supernatural how bright it is in headlights. Um, I guess the Mona Lisa has an element of that where he had almost like transparent, invisible type layers of paint below other layers to like create that almost supernatural effect in his art. And, and that, even though that effect came from his study of different chemicals or, or different, um, you know, compounds, whatever was used at the time in paint. Okay. So also Leonardo was way into uh, the study of proportion. And so, you know, if you look at the Mona Lisa, there's a lot more going on, uh, on, on like an invisible level or at a structural level uh, than meets the eye. So on the left, you can see, of course, that it's the painting as we know it. And on the right, there's they're like these almost invisible, satisfying structural elements that make it amazing. And that, again, came from Leonardo's study of the component structural parts of his art. So, OK, so we're, we're talking a lot about art history and paint. So let's get into the application to music and how we can use this specifically in our study of music theory for songwriting. Um, <clears throat> Uh, though before we do that, I just wanted to point out that again, both artists are great and they both show up in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I think this one's Leonardo. If, if anyone knows, if I'm wrong, I think the blue headband is Leonardo. And, you know, we can all get along as friends, but when it comes to really knowing your stuff, studying the science of art and the art of science is where it's at. And that's what music theory is all about. So let's get to... <clears throat> that concept I mentioned about the three angles. So Da Vinci, uh, this is this is a great example of him studying things from multiple angles, but he did this all the time. This is across his sketchbooks and across his, his notebooks where he was like a big believer in seeing things, not only at a deeper level, but from multiple angles. And that definitely is valuable when it comes to songwriting. So uh, specifically... Um, these are different views of chords, okay? And these are uh, chords in the key of F, F major, for example. And a lot of times musicians, and I, again, this was me for sure as I was first getting into music, is I was like, I just want to learn chords, just cut to the chase. I want to learn how to play chords. 
And then once I've memorized a bunch of chords, I just want to just have this arsenal of harmonic understanding and just string them together into chord progressions, make songs. And that's as far as I want to go into theory. Like, I don't want to waste my time on theory. I just want to learn chords. But the thing about just memorizing a bunch of finger shapes or, you know, how to contort your finger on the fretboard is that you're, it's like you're, you're basically, you're not passionate enough to, to know how it works. <laughs> you're, you, the universal you is, you know, you could be a great Michelangelo, but you could be an even better Leonardo by just slowing down a little bit, going a little bit deeper to try to really understand the structural components of chords. And then once you can see them, to see them from different angles. So by different angles, I mean, here, here are the different angles we have here. In a table format, in the key of F, these are all of the different uh, notes in the key of F. So for example, we have uh, F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, and F. Um, and then, so that's this pattern right here. And then if we just continue on, uh, so I'm gonna start at F again. So that's the whole stretch of, it's basically a scale and a half. And then by picking out every other note, we can create seven different chords in the key of F. F major, uh, G minor, A minor, B major, C major, and so on. So that right there tells us how chords are formed. These intervals of major thirds and minor thirds, like in F major, F to A is a major third, A to C is a minor third. In G minor, uh, G to B flat is a minor third, B flat to D is a major third, and so on. So it's basically just major thirds and minor thirds. So knowing how chords are constructed is insightful, but this is one view of chords, is just structurally the bones. These are the bones of chords. And another way that you can look at this is in a circular format, where you have whole, oh, let me get, hold on. You have whole, why is that not drawing? Whole. Like doesn't want to draw. Hold on. Whole. <laughs> I really just want to say whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. But you can see it here, right? I don't know why my pen isn't working. But it's whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Um, that also just highlights the pattern, the underlying intervals of the major scale. So um, these are... That really is strange that my pen isn't working. Let me see if I can like zoom away and then refer. Oh, there we go. It is showing up. Weird. Okay. Okay. So we have whole, huh? Whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Now, those intervals are important uh, in understanding how the scale is formed in the first place. And then this table shows how different chords are formed, uh, but in kind of a more abstract table format. And then to look at how these notes are laid out on the fretboard based on how notes are arranged uh, on the guitar fretboard, you can see how they're, they form, you know, on the e, low E string here, there's whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. Or you could zoom in and look at, we have, there's a whole step and then another whole step and a half step, whole, 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 half. So you can rise up the strings by jumping between strings. Um, or, you know, you can go up different octaves where we have, oh, let's do it again. There we go. Um, starting on this F right here, whole, whole, or sorry, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half because there's this shift in the top two strings. So just knowing, okay, now I understand the structure or the framework of notes on the fretboard, that's helpful. And then also to understand chords in their normal format as they're shown as chord diagrams, understanding how to play those shapes as they're depicted in like song form and all of that. So if you just wanted to learn chords, you, normally people just cut to the chase here and try to learn these chord shapes 
without asking any questions. They're just like, I just want to learn how to play an F major chord. I don't need to know anything more than that. Just, just as a true botanist or a true arborist, if they were into a forestry, you know, study of forestry, they wouldn't just point at a tree and say, that's a tree. They would need to understand how bark works, how chlorophyll uh, and uh, all of the chemicals in photosynthesis work. Like they'd need to know more than just that's a tree. Just like any musician, we need to know that more than that's an F chord, <laughs> just how you place your fingers. I guess it's fine if, if that's all you want to do. If you just want to recreationally play other people's stuff and learn how to play, that's fine. But when it comes to music theory for songwriting and creating your own art, you need to understand the underlying science. That's what Leonardo da Vinci is telling us is study the science of art and the art of science to really create your best work. Um, so let's see. So with that knowledge, you then, you know, can draw upon your understanding of all of these different patterns. I talk about all these patterns in the course. Um, so, you know, it's, it's beautiful how these patterns work, but there's obviously more, more to it than just here's a diagram. Like there's an explanation and, and seeing how these work. This actually is uh, what we're going to get into part five. We're about to jump into part five in the course in the fretboard matrix, diving in with the magnifying glass of music theory to a degree in depth that we haven't done done yet. Uh, so that's something I'm excited about uh, coming right up. So when Leonardo talks about, you know, the art of science and the science of art, he's really kind of talking about the, and, and I know scientifically this isn't exactly how it works, but the whole concept of left brain and right brain um, that, you know, traditionally, traditionally over like the past century, you know, some, some have said that the left brain is more of the logical or scientific type thinking, whereas the right brain is more of the artistic, uh, creative side of the brain. So to be able to, you know, work with both sides, there's no reason to, to give ourselves an artificial lobotomy and just, just say that, art and feeling and emotion is all where it's at. There's something to be said for music theory and uh, having that cross pollination and drawing from both is where you can create your best stuff. Don't lobotomize yourself even unintentionally by dismissing theory. That's what I would say and do say to uh, our, our musical friends who haven't discovered the beauty of music theory. Um, so that is what I want to talk about and Leonardo da Vinci, I, I definitely recommend Michael Gelb's book and really anything on Leonardo da Vinci, because there's so much that we can draw from. I mean, he lived, he died in the 1500s and he was way ahead of his time. And uh, even we in our own time uh, can learn a lot from him. <clears throat> definitely kind of more of a conceptual uh, discussion this evening than uh, an application of these ideas, but talking about how, once you understand these concepts, that's where you can start to apply things instead of just hit and miss, learn some shapes, hope they fit together. There is a science to the art of songwriting as Leonardo lets us know. Um, so I want to uh, jump into some of the comments here and uh, let's see. All right, so Rodney, uh, the more you know, the better off you are totally right uh, and it makes me think of a George Harrison lyric. The more I learn, the less I know. There's also like a humility, I think, to learning. Whenever I see musicians online or offline who have this increasing inflated ego, I'm like, you must be missing the point because like music is amazing and we're just uh, all basking in its reflected glow. But I totally agree with you. The more you are, the better off, you, or the more you know, the better off you are. Um, hey, thanks, Gary. I appreciate your feedback. Um, and I'm glad that you like the channel. And uh, always let the algorithm know that if you enjoyed it, uh, I appreciate you being here. And I'm so happy that we can geek out together on the beauties of music theory. Um, let's see. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So Gary, Leonardo did the golden ratio in the drawing of man. 
Um, yeah, and there's also the um, Vitruvian Man, if I'm saying that right, the the square and the circle, which, you know, color music uh, is using squares and circles. And I actually uh, use that illustration in Lesson 10. Uh, there's There's so much. Like, Leonardo da Vinci was brilliant, and I'm just kind of scratching the surface on some of the insights that you can draw from him, but it goes, there's even more to it. And uh, yeah, he did amazing stuff. Um, Tony, I like that you, uh, that you're tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you definitely are, you are ahead of your time, just like <laughs> Leonardo. You're definitely ahead of my time. And <clears throat> I'm glad that uh, it's not like crazy late for you right now. Um, so you've got sunshine. I love it. Um, Gary, uh, Pythagorean discovered the ratio between notes. Yeah, so, you know, Pythagorean, <clears throat> Pythagoras uh, was like the father of music theory in that, you know, in Western music, he, you know, discovered the octave or certainly, you know, dissected the octave and came up with the, you know, ratios and the intervals that we use in Western music. There have been some tweaks in terms of the spacing between intervals and all of that, but it really comes down to the, these are geometric patterns and uh, these relationships between notes are symmetrical, cyclical, and inform everything in music. And you really only know that once you get into music theory. And thank you to Leonardo. He, he advises us to delve into that, to geek out, to get into the science behind things. Uh, Gary... So a uh, theory is critical, like grammar is to language. Exactly. That's completely right. In fact, uh, you know, you, you would, you would never want to just like say, Hey, you know, what I'm trying to say is, cause I've used this metaphor before and I'm <clears throat> trying to think of the best way to put it. Like someone who is great at reading poetry is, you know, that's great. Like, that's awesome. If you're a great orator or you can recite poetry beautifully, that's awesome. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like playing Stairway to Heaven amazingly well. Like, that's cool. But, you know, Jimmy Page understood the grammar to compose that poetry, to use the, you know, poetry language metaphor. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to know grammar to recite a poem but you really need to know it at least on an instinctive level, if not consciously what the rules and, and uh, all of the, the regulations of grammar are, but you, you do need to understand it uh, for sure. And that's, that's an excellent way to put it. I love it, Gary. Um, okay. And thank you, Virtuous Heretic for the link to Michael Gelb's book. Definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, Virtuous Heretic took, told me about this book in the first place. Uh, so it's, it's amazing work. Um, that book is awesome. Alapico, very cool. So glad you made it. And um, I, it's it's a party now that you're here. So <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, so Gary, this is a good point. Some musicians see sound as colors and uh, there's a phrase for it. Well, if it's like an actual physical sensation, it is um, synesthesia where some people hear the color blue or they'll hear a certain pitch and it is orange or, you know, you know, mellow gold or whatever, whatever the color is. And so, um, and I've, I've had some people, actually a lot of people comment saying, ah, I have synesthesia. So this, this conflicts with the way that I perceive uh, color. And I can see if you have synesthesia that, you know, these color patterns, you know, are these are these color patterns are not subjective or they're not uh, triggered by sensory inputs. They're based on the logical patterns of how the circle of fifths is formed, the connection between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale. So it's like it's a way of giving everyone who doesn't naturally have synesthesia a, a kind of synesthesia, but like an objective one uh, to use that science is objective, whereas art is subjective. It's more of an objective one, meaning it's showing how the patterns work rather than just an impression of sound. Um, but to be able to see sound is the key. I've also had, you know, on the the idea of seeing sound, you know, some some people also respond with, yeah, but I'm colorblind. 
to what am I supposed to do? Uh, and but then I also know of people and there are people, you know, on locals who are like, I'm colorblind and I love this. This this helps me. Um, the shapes help to communicate the the intervals um, that don't rely on colors. And uh, depending on the kind of colorblindness they have, they're able to see uh, see an altered form of this, but they're still inside there. So, uh, yeah, definitely be able to see it. And yeah, Star Rider, I love it. So Pythagoras, uh, Music of the Spheres. Uh, yeah, and uh, definitely check out my video on Pythagoras and uh, what, oh yeah, yeah, it's about uh, the, the connection between the calendar and the piano and the chromatic scale. Um, kind of interesting. Uh, it's, I think it's just coincidental, but it's pretty awesome uh, talking about different connections uh, between different patterns. Um, let's see. So, hey, Jack, it's very cool to see you on. So glad you're here. And uh, we're geeking out about Leonardo. Um, so, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, let's let's check this out. Virtuous Heretic, you said that in the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, just to confirm that Michelangelo is orange and yeah, and Leonardo is blue. So they happen to be complementary colors. They're kind of like tritones. <laughs> we could read into that all evening. I didn't realize that they like pizza. Is that because they're all Italian Renaissance artists? Raphael and uh, who's the other one? And does anyone remember? Oh, is it is it in here? Does anyone in the chat let me know if you remember who the fourth one is? We've got, oh, let's see, let's see. Oh, yeah. That's right. Red is Raphael and purple is Donatello. Um, so we can, we can get into the depth of music theory or we can get into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. All right. Um, let's jump in <laughs> the next comment here. Um, I love it. So where am I in the comments? Okay, so... All right, nuts uh, from Berserk. Are you explaining how art and music are correlated with math? So, um, in this, I'm talking about how art and science are two sides of the same coin. Um, but music and color both follow the same geometric patterns, and by that I mean you don't have to get out a protractor or calculate the you know hypotenuse of an angle. When I say that, I'm not talking about math like that level of math, I'm talking about angles, relationships, and intervals, and symmetry. So, um, so yes, there, oh, there are uh, definite uh, connections between all of these things. I mean, everything is, when you get down to it, math. Uh, but even just from a relative layman's perspective, to see the geometry of music is pretty intuitive, especially once you can see it. Um, Key music, pretty sure uh, turtles can't draw arms uh, <laughs> that well. Yeah, uh, turtles, and, and if you don't know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came much after the Renaissance and only a reference to these historical figures. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Um, so, hey, that one Geo Girl, cool, just joined. So glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Love to see you on. Um, and many vibes. Very cool. I'm glad to see you here as well. Um, all right. So, uh, Luke. So, I agreed with you, Mike. Albums are books. And, uh, yeah, it's it's cool. You can look at music from different levels, whether you're looking at, at the atomic level of chords or how those chords are formed into progressions, progressions into songs, songs into albums, albums into discographies. So all of these things, music, music is fractal in that way for sure. It's it's all layered, very multi-layered. Um, yeah, so that's awesome, uh, Star Rider. Actually, I'm working on a 432 hertz tuned acoustic guitar. So um, 432 is a very interesting frequency. I'll need to talk about that sometime. Someone uh, brought that up. It might have been you, Star Rider. Who brought that up in the last live stream? Um, there's some really cool connections and an emphasis on the key of F sharp, actually. Um, so, yeah, so to your point, many vibes, Leonardo did play music. Uh, 
he even came up with a stringed instrument. I don't know if it had a name. Um, <clears throat> I don't know uh, that he necessarily was a composer. Maybe he was, but uh, it, as you rewatch, you'll see, I'm talking more about insights that he had <clears throat> between, pardon the throat here, the connection between art and science and how we can use some of his insights to apply his thinking to what music theory is because his insights <clears throat> while he was talking more about mechanics and form structure painting art and all of that it's all the same stuff i mean music is basically another art form that uh we can leverage those same concepts to apply um let's see so uh okay so that one geo girl uh, have you thought of making violin labels that's a great question and uh, violin is, uh, in one of a, a recent live streams, so relatively recent, we talked about <clears throat> how the violin is just kind of a, a permutation or reflection of the bass guitar, which is a subset of the six string guitar. And uh, the violin is, I don't have specific plans for violin in the immediate future, but uh, working on some universal labels that are uh can be applied to any instrument so you can come up with the tuning and configuration of your choice uh so more to come on that great question and i'll be talking more about the universal labels here in the coming weeks uh i'm currently working on bass guitar labels uh those are going to be the next uh the next ones out thank you for your question uh let's see so uh elijah you said uh, thank you for this, Mike. Would you please make a video about the frequencies and tuning an instrument? Like, what is going to happen if I tune my guitar to 440 hertz instead of the standard one, which is 432? That's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, so instead of having like A at 440 um, to come up with the different tuning, that's, that's I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and, uh, and I need to marinate on that. So thank you for your question. Um, that's cool. So uh, that one Joe girl, uh, you're learning to play the violin. So the universal labels uh, will come into play for you. They should be very helpful in that process. Um, many vibes you said, I think you did uh, enjoy reading Leonard Schlein, if I'm saying that correct, uh, pontificating on the alphabet versus uh, the goddess and how he ties in art and science. That's cool. Thank you for this recommendation. So Leonard Schlein, um, I, and the alphabet versus the goddess. I'll need to look into that. That sounds fascinating. And connezione, like Leonardo is talking about, uh, connections between things. Uh, you know, one wouldn't necessarily think to pontificate on the alphabet versus goddess and yet making connections between seemingly disparate points is what it's all about. That is in essence, what music theory is is making connections between things. It's all about the intervals between notes. Uh, and there are connections between things. There are connections between notes. And without being able to see it and just focusing on the shapes alone, if you're just like, this is where I put my finger, this is where I put my finger, you're not gonna see it. You're just not gonna see it. And everything else that it reveals. Um, okay, so... Um, <laughs> so am I a boomer because I know of, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Maybe so. Um, <laughs> thank you for the clarification on that. Um, all right. So Eric, you said having seen both the David and Mona Lisa in person, there's really no comparison. The David is vastly better art. I admire Da Vinci, but Michelangelo, uh, was incomparable so i appreciate that feedback or that you know that in that take on those because i will admit when i first look at these two i think and maybe it's just due to the size you know that david is towering whereas the mona lisa is it's often uh considered physically bigger than it is in real life um and if anything i, I will say you can see like his muscle tone here, whereas she looks kind of lumpy. It almost feels like his dissections, you know, that we looked at in this notebook up above, aren't necessarily coming through there. If anything, it looks like when you have these two images side by side that Michelangelo is the one who did the dissections and uh, 
the Mona Lisa or that Leonardo studied things on a surface level. <laughs> I mean, just using these two side by side. So I can, I can definitely see your point. I had that conscious thought when I put these two side by side. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of Leonardo, but that's the thing about, about art is it is a subjective thing when it comes down to it. Art is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but as far as like the study of the art and what went into it, Leonardo uh, definitely studied it more to his detriment sometimes. Actually, I think this is in, it's either in the Michael Gell book or another one where I think it was Michelangelo. They had this, the rivalry was so hot that they had this paint off where the two of them were like painting different uh, frescoes, I guess is the term, in the same like chapel, like in the same room across from each other. And, uh, you know, Leonardo famously didn't finish a lot of his works. And this was a case where he was trying to experiment with this way to like keep the, the wall moist or something. And so he like started painting before it had dried, like the plaster of the wall wasn't set or something. And then he started painting thinking that that would give him an advantage or would have this artistic effect. And the paint made the, the plaster like buckle or like collapse or something. And so I think Michelangelo was, you know, ding, ding, you know, awarded the winner <laughs> on that. Um, so yeah. Uh, interesting how, how all of the, these things play out. Um, Alpico, you could use a grayscale gradient instead of color gradient in the wheel. Yes. Uh, speaking to, I imagine with uh, colorblindness, but it's easier to distinguish colors for sure. Um, it's the changes into the adjacent color grade that's the important part. Yeah, so the circle of fifths, I don't have the circle of fifths here, but the circle of fifths being analogous to the color wheel, more than analogous, they're just visual and auditory representations of the same pattern in that they represent the same relationships. Yeah, so you could use a, a, a gradient circle and you know, those who are colorblind, depending on the type of colorblindness, might see it as such. Uh, but the colors definitely do help, for sure. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, and Luke, you said, uh, to me, deluxe edition albums are a full book, while the standard album are like a mini book. It's interesting. It, the way that you can uh, compile things in different ways, and it's all fractal, how all, all of these uh, elements interact. Um so Rodney, you said Leonardo introduced viola organista. So is that like the instrument that he designed? Um, uh, Cause I know he designed something, but I don't know what it was. And that kind of sounds familiar. It was a stringed instrument, I believe that he designed. Um, let's see. Yes, I agree with you, Alpico. It is an excellent reference. Um, okay, so Denidri, you said, uh, I used keyboard labels on one Onyx guitars, just circle of fifths, chromatic, and major scale worked well. Um, so interesting. Uh, oh, interesting. So just the circle of fifths and major scale. I'd be interested to see what that looks like, um, to see how that turned out. Um, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, and many vibes, you said, he also has one titled Physics and Art. Oh, okay, so Leonard. Uh, how do I pronounce his last name? Uh, Schlein. Leonard Schlein. Okay, cool. I'll check that out. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, Gary, mention the significance of modes. So if I'm understanding correctly, yes, that is another thing too. Like you wouldn't, like to be able to see sound, uh, is really what makes modes click. I tried to I tried to understand modes before understanding music theory through color music, and it was so abstract. The idea of permutations, because the patterns themselves were pretty difficult to try to understand, um, let alone permutations upon those patterns, uh, was kind of crazy. So yeah, like um, so with modes, the fact that like for example, you have C. Uh, the key of C, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and that, uh, you know, C mixolydian 
is a permutation of the F major scale, but with F of worth C is one. So it becomes one, two, three. And then uh, where's my four, four, five, six, seven, and back to one. So uh, yeah, like to see sound is uh, definitely not a disadvantage or, a, or a, a wet blanket on creativity. It is what allows you to dance in music. I think a lot of times people think of music theory as it's going to trip you up when really music theory is what allows you to dance. I think not knowing music theory is what trips you up. Um, I might've taken that in a totally different direction, Gary, <laughs> than you intended, uh, but it's, it all connects. Um, yes. So, uh, but on that, um, definitely uh, all of these different modes, I'm going to do one that talks more about, you know, the range of modes from, you know, these, you know, light to dark modes, which are shown here. I'm, I'm just using the key of C as an example. Um, we'll talk more about that. It's been a minute since we've kind of delved into that. So um, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Um, and uh, Virtue of Cyrotech, Mona's a little voluptuous. Okay. Yeah. 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 Voluptuous. I think the adjective I used was uh, maybe lumpy, <laughs> which no disrespect to uh, the long deceased. She's more voluptuous and uh, she's the most famous art piece in, in the world. So there's something to say for that. Um, all right. So let's check out. Um, okay, cool. Let me see if I can. All right. I'm going to learn how to navigate this a little better. Um, yeah. So sorry, I'm catching up on my, where I am. I lost where I am. Okay. Gary, you said, didn't Michelangelo also work in architecture? Um, he may have. I know that he did, you know, like the Sistine Chapel, which is one of the most famous ceilings in the world. Maybe he did. If anyone here, maybe there's a comment that I'm coming up upon uh, where, uh, oh yeah, St. Peter's Basilica. Okay. So yeah, they, they're, they're known as Renaissance men for a very good reason. The Renaissance is an amazing period in time. And as far as the Renaissance goes with music, so just a, a quick detour on that. So the Renaissance was amazing because especially with music, you had this proliferation of, you know, Gutenberg, Johann Gutenberg came up with the printing press and he uh, basically popularized sheet music for musicians so that people suddenly had at their fingertips, they had, you know, instruments and then they had this sheet music. So they, there was this Renaissance in terms of just people being able to create, create music as well, which is awesome. But imagine a Renaissance where it's not just people creating music or just recreating songs that were pre recorded for them, but to actually create is amazing. And to, to have music theory and armed with music theory in your art is like your own personal, personal renaissance. Uh, speaking of. Um, okay, so Alapico's suggestion, explain how the various pentatonic scales are the essential core of their containing diatonic scale and how using the optional non-pentatonic notes enlivens a composition. That is a great one. I'm definitely going to talk about that. Um, there's a, a video that I did talking about pentatonic scales and how they're basically mode agnostic, the major and minor pentatonic scale that one overlays, you know, the, the major pentatonic overlays with the major modes uh, and, and minor pentatonic with minor modes. Um, but that's a great one. And I love your point about the optional non-pentatonic uh, penta notes enlivening a composition, adding that extra flavor. Um, yeah, that's going to be, we'll talk about that because that's a great topic. Um, so that may be the next one. We'll see. Cause I, I, there's a lot to talk about there. Um, thank you for that suggestion. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Boomster Black, if I'm saying that correct, correctly, um, no second or sixth in pentatonic. Yeah. One, uh, three, four, five, and seven. Yeah. We'll talk about pentatonic. Pentatonic's awesome. Uh, and that's another, that's another one where just like with chord shapes, 
you know, for the longest time, I personally was just like, yeah, pentatonic. Penta means five, tonic tones, five tones. Okay. So what's the theory behind that? But just as you pointed out, like, yeah, there's, there's no second or, or sixth. Um, and to, to peel off the skin, Leonardo da Vinci style to, to, and the nice thing is the studying music theory isn't like having to strap on a handkerchief and get into the morgue. <laughs> it's not as, not as ghastly or repulsive as that. It's actually really enjoyable and beautiful. Uh, so we'll, we'll dissect that. Um, very good stuff. Um, yes. Uh, let's see. Just catching up here. Um, okay. To your point, virtuous heretic, um, cause I think you're speaking to, um, the comment, uh, about the application of the labels, the piano labels to the guitar, um, that star writer, no, no, no star writer. You had mentioned a anyway, it was a great point. Um, I've lost my, where I am in the thread, but yes, you can apply basically piano labels to the fretboard. Um, and the universal labels are going to be designed specifically, uh, for any instrument and you can do the same with those. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, uh, booster black, uh, scales make the arpeggios and arpeggios make chords. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, chords are basically, or arpeggios are like dissected chords. Um, so yeah, they're all, it's all fractal, right? Like every, every pattern is a subset of the others, but then they also turn back and rotate back on themselves, like the chromatic scale and circle of fifths. So Whereas Leonardo's dissection of the human body was illuminating and amazing um, to dissect music is like especially mind blowing because it, because of the geometry, because of the fractal geometry that's going on. Uh, it's like you find things that you really don't expect to see. That was for sure the case with me. Gary, you said that uh, the viola organista is a musical instrument designed by Leonardo da Vinci. Very cool. It uses a friction belt to vibrate individual strings, similar to how a violin produces sounds uh, with the strings uh, that are selected. So that's awesome. Um, and uh, he wasn't messing around. Like that's such an ambitious <laughs> way to make music. Uh, he was... He was going beyond just, hey, where do I place my fingers? So that's awesome. Um, Denitri said, fifths on high E and B strings, major scale on G or D, chromatic on the A string. Okay, Denitri, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, you've applied these to your fretboard and I love it. I mean, that is, that the way you're approaching it is like you're kind of taking the Leonardo approach of a viola organista and that you're not messing around. Like you're like, going for it, which is super awesome. Um, like that is the ethos that we're talking about. I absolutely love it. Um, all right. So, uh, just going to wrap it up here in just a minute. Um, and Gary, you said that, uh, Michelangelo, uh, was an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, and poet of the high Renaissance. Yes. Uh, Michelangelo was, he did all sorts of stuff. And to your point, architect as well is in his resume, his vast resume. Um, so let's see. Star Rider, you said, um, sometimes spirituality and sciences do reach around. Um, yeah, it's all, I think every subject, you know, I remember walking around a university campus, seeing all of these buildings. You have the history building, the architecture, the, the math, the sciences, the medical facility, like, there we think of them as these distinct subjects because they're separate buildings, but they're all just different angles of the same thing. Just like music is every, every key is symmetrical because they all are just looking in at the same patterns, just from a different perspective. Um, Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Um, many vibes. The dude signed his paintings, Michelangelo, the sculptor. That's interesting. Is that he would really sign it? The sculptor, even a painting. Um, so he's, it's like a flourish saying like, I'm not a one trick pony. Like this is, this is one aspect of me, which again is getting at the looking at things from multiple angles. So, I mean, for sure there was obviously some personal jealousy going on, um, or just, uh, human avarice between the two, uh, when Michelangelo was obviously legitimately good. 
I mean, I'm pretty sure he's a better sculptor than I am. <laughs> I can say that. Um, let's see. Oh, that's cool. So, uh, Virtuous Heretic, I almost uh, minored in art history in college, and I did not know or remember that Michelangelo signed his paintings that way. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Uh, and he'd have to have extra space for that um, to make that point. Um, when I play, which is always improv, that's cool, I dance through the musical space, hitting notes, transitions with my fingertips due to playing a uke. It's all about it's all about the ability to dance. And, you know, when you're dancing, knowing that you're not going to trip or fall off the stage or back into the furniture, wherever you're dancing, knowing the layout of the space is like knowing the layout of the fretboard or the keyboard or, you know, on the uke, knowing where you can dance, where, where it's safe to move and uh and will yield the coolest results is what it's all about and i always love alapico your your way of articulating ideas because it's it's like poetry um speaking of poetry uh let's see so um yeah so boomster black uh major major minor minor yeah so the different modes yeah that's a good uh, synopsis the different modes are uh there's definitely a connection between all of these modes uh, because all of these intervals that form them because they're permutations of each other, they all like bleed into each other. Just as all scales overlap in the circle of fifths, all of the modes overlap in the circle of fifths as well because they're permutations of each other. So we'll talk about that. Uh, pentatonic scales, modes, uh, these are subjects that we'll definitely be talking more about. Um, uh, right on. Yeah, I can play uh, piano because I know theory. And there's something to be said for sure of broadening the range just as, you know, Renaissance, mus uh, Renaissance musicians, Renaissance artists like uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo, uh, you know, were signing their paintings as sculptor or they were architects or they were, you know, creating instruments like they were doing all sorts of stuff to broaden uh, you know, to play multiple instruments, to be a multi-instrumentalist uh, is not as hard as it sounds, um, especially once you can see theory, once you know theory, because all of these patterns are the same. They're consistent across from one to the next. So uh, that's awesome. Like just jumping around instruments is what it's all about. Um, all right. Well, uh, it's good to see you, Jack. I'm so glad you joined and I hope you have a good evening. And as we wrap it up, I hope you have a good evening as well. Um, it's fun to geek out in some kind of unexpected ways like Leonardo da Vinci. What the hell does he have to do with music theory? A lot, as it turns out. And we'll be geeking out about some of these topics that we brought up uh, in the chat. Thank you for these suggestions on some cool stuff to cover. So I hope you have a great rest of your day, night, evening, whatever it might be. And we will be talking very soon. I will see you. Bye.